get our discussion uh, going this morning on what is happening in the aviation industry. I'm going to go to uh, Greg to just uh, set up the topic before I do our formal introductions. Well, thank you very much. Thank thank you very much, Senator. Again, uh, Government Analytics is honored to to pull these types of sessions off. The objective here is just to put words to uh, some of the data that we keep crunching. And uh, and the aviation sector, I mean, everybody's aware of it. Anyone who likes to get on a plane knows how how difficult the situation is. And uh, with our guests today, again, we're just humbled to have uh, people of of this experience and and, uh, incredible background. So, Senator, I'll leave it to you to carry us through the rest of the session. And again, thank you all very much. Thanks, Greg, very much. So, as we all know, COVID-19 has rendered Canada's decades-old aviation policy unworkable and all but grounded an airline industry. The rebuild could take years. The fear of flying persists. International travel restrictions keep piling up. Regional routes have either been cancelled or drastically cut back, and business travel may actually never return to normal in the world of Zoom. These are the issues for a sector already heavily impacted by politics, regional disparities, and of course, regulation. Ottawa's intention on any bailout remains, shall we say, a little unclear, despite the fact that more than 100,000 people are employed in the sector. Later in our program, Joe Sparling, President and CEO of Air North, Yukon's airline. But first, Don Carty, former CEO of American Airlines and too many other posts in the aviation sector to actually list here, including, of course, Virgin Airlines and Air Canada. Following the September 11 attacks, Don led the largest corporate restructuring outside of a bankruptcy in U.S. history. But in 2006, he re-engaged in the Canadian aviation sector, serving as chair of the board of Toronto-based Porter Airlines. Full disclosure, I served on that board as well. So welcome, Don. Good to see you. Thank you, Bella. So let us start out with this rather uh, bleak year. Air Canada saying that it is the bleakest year for them in aviation history. 1.6 billion quarterly loss in Q4 2020. Bill Gates, the world's leading authority on everything these days, says that business travel will really at best only return to 50%. Even Bombardier stopped making rear jets. Where are we? Yeah, we're, we're in a very difficult situation, uh, Pamela. The, the, the aviation sector, not just in Canada, but worldwide, has been decimated by this. Uh, travel is down dramatically. It varies a little by, by country, but uh, travel in Canada in particular is down much more dramatically than it is in the U.S. Um, and, and that's to some degree a byproduct of government policy. I mean, clearly we've been discouraging travel uh, and and will continue to discourage travel. But the consequence is, you know, nine or ten percent of the travel that existed pre-pandemic exists today, and and in some regions even less than that. So it, it, it's a very very tough time, and it's a very tough time for the airlines to sustain operations because uh, every day they lose cash. What is the difference in the psychology? You're a, you're a dual citizen. You're a Canadian by birth. You've lived and worked in both countries. In Canada, the response has been primarily to the uh, air, major airlines uh, wage subsidies, about $500 million. The U.S. response is direct funding uh, to at least the tune of $50 billion. So we're at about a third of the financial assistance that we've seen offered in the U.S. Why the different approaches? Well, you know, that's a good question. Uh, The U.S. made a very conscious decision that, one, they wanted to sustain the transportation infrastructure, and they recognized that the airlines were unable or unwilling to do that for financial reasons. Two, they wanted to uh, sustain the, the employment in the U.S. airline business. They wanted that technical capability to stay in place. And so they they married those two objectives by uh, granting these large uh, amounts of money to the airlines on the condition they continue to employ the employees. So an enormous amount of this money passed right through the airlines to the airline employees, which saved the government unemployment insurance 
costs, but it also sustained all those jobs. It also created an incentive for the airlines because they had the employees anyway, the incremental cost of doing one more flight was simply fuel and landing fees. So they made a decision to keep more airplanes flying as a result of that, uh, of those uh, grants by the government. In Canada, um, you know, there, there was more active discouragement of travel by the government. Canada's <laughs> clearly a more closed economy than the U.S. It varies a little in the U.S. by region, but largely people still travel in the United States. Our travel is probably 30% plus of what it was pre-pandemic versus a 9 or 10% in Canada. And, and uh, the Canadian government um, hasn't yet, although I gather they're still in negotiations with all the parties, made the same kinds of decisions around policy. I, I, think, I think what's troublesome as time goes on is all those people that have been laid off, um, uh, you know, are, are going to require different levels of training to reenter the, the, the business again. So putting them back to work will be a challenge. And I, I think it will take longer to restore the transportation infrastructure that a country like Canada obviously needs. I mean, you can't you can't survive as a country economically without a you transportation can, you, infrastructure. You cannot get there from here without a plane. <laughs> That's, that's even in exactly my province, right. there aren't even any buses. I mean, you actually need to be able to fly there. Yeah, I think I think Canada got a little bit lucky in the fact that I think Air Canada and WestJet probably thought the government would move reasonably quickly to, uh, to, to policies more similar to the U.S. And they kept planes flying that made no economic sense. Right. So what you've seen in recent months is WestJet and Air Canada continue to cut service because every time they have a plane take off, they lose more money. So they're better off to, you know, at Porter, we made a very simple decision. You know, we fly into Atlantic Canada. Atlantic Canada was closed. We fly into the U.S. The U.S. was essentially closed. And we fly short haul in, in uh, central Canada. And, uh, you know, there are driving options for most of those routes. So we, we knew that our airplanes would all lose money. So we essentially grounded the entire airline. Um, and again, a very difficult decision because all our employees then had to go on, on uh, government programs. But I think you're going to see, you know, if there isn't uh, some kind of change in policy, and I know the government and the other interest parties are working on it, uh, Air Canada and WestJet will just get smaller and smaller. So here we are. I mean, we're, we're trying to figure out what the government is doing. They are in negotiation. Um, and I guess, what, I mean, it's not that they're just going to leave it to market forces. You can't do that, obviously, in a low demand uh, economy. So there's going to have to be some kind of uh, regulation, re-regulation, the imposition of uh, the government's intent on the behavior of airlines. So how do you see that? Like, what are the options? Yeah, I, I think all those that you hear de being debated are, are part of the discussion. You know, the ma maintenance, you know, in return for certain financial subsidies, the airlines will be required to do certain things. And whether that involves uh, maintaining employment le levels, whether it involves uh, certain regional coverage that uh, has been lost uh, already uh, remains to be seen. And I think that's what the negotiation and discussion is all about. U.S. again took a little bit different approach. They kind of listened to everybody and then they just made a decision. And I, I think Canada, uh, it, 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 the Canadian government is trying to get everybody to agree uh, to, to a, a policy, but the problem with that approach is it's taking a lot of time. And, um, that's the challenge. The other concern, and there was a piece recently in um, a policy options magazine where it, it takes a look back over the situation in the 1980s when there really was a political decision on the part of uh, the then conservative government to say, we need to deregulate. We really need to get hands off with this. And it, it, it has worked relatively well over time, although consumers, uh, when they look at the pricing of uh, flying in the U.S. versus the price of flying in Canada, it's, it's very expensive here, relatively speaking. But it seems that Ottawa's response, and we're uh, potentially on the verge of another election, 
uh, has more to do with electoral considerations than actual servicing communities and survival of airlines. How do we have regulation, government intervention, them paying the bill without having this become a political decision about which areas get funding and which areas don't and which areas get flights and landings and which areas don't? Yeah, Pam, as you know, probably as well as anybody, uh, the minute you begin that kind of regulation, you, you are into a political discussion. And, and that's, yeah. that, of course, is the challenge. Um, I'd argue that deregulation has worked extremely well for most big markets. Hasn't always worked well for regional markets. I think, I think uh, uh, the Canadian government was thoughtful in, in uh, maintaining regulation in parts of the north maybe other parts of the country where that needs to happen. And where you have government regulation, you are going to have the government having to make political choices. And it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. I, I think it would be a terrible mistake to re-regulate all of the industry, particularly in those parts where regulation has worked extremely well um, uh, because of a, of a challenge in certain, uh, in certain regions. And I would say this, you know, I, uh, uh, Canadians are troubled by Canadian airfares versus U.S. airfares, uh, but they might look to the tax burden that Canadian airlines <laughs> pay compared to the U.S. airlines. Um, yeah. Canada is a company, as we were a country, as we were saying earlier, that needs a transportation infrastructure and and wants to encourage travel around Canada. Probably the last place you want to heavily tax uh, because you're doing the opposite. You're discouraging air travel. But if the uh, if the travel doesn't return, I mean, if the speculation is correct that business travel, which is the bread and butter of certainly the larger airlines, if that's at a ongoing minus 50 percent, um, do you agree with that? Do you actually think that that will happen? Um, yeah, and, I, and then I, I, I have. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, uh, Bill Gates makes a, a very good point. I think we've all lear- learned to be on Zoom or Teams or uh, whatever uh, technology we're using to communicate, and we're finding it pretty effective in many, many cases. And, and the consequence is, and it's not just to save air travel for businesses, it's to make people more productive. You know, if you've got to spend a whole day traveling, you're not as productive on that day as you are uh, when, you, when you're working. So I, I think you're going to see a, a permanent change in air travel. I I don't think it's fifty percent, but it but it's it's not a small number. All that being said, I think we're going to see uh, the minute uh, we feel capable of doing so, you're going to see a huge increase in the demand for leisure travel. People want to. People yeah. have been locked down way too long. And everybody I know wants to take a trip. So I, I think <laughs> leisure travel is going to be very, very strong. And in just in terms uh, of the it, different... It, it is going to be a sea change. Yeah. In terms of the structure in the U.S., a lot more airlines, obviously, and, and then kind of the hub and spoke system where you have to go somewhere to get somewhere. Um, I mean, we do that in, in Canada as well. I mean, you have to either go to Toronto or Vancouver, basically, sometimes Montreal, if you want to get, you know, somewhere out of the country. Uh, Will we have to change our thinking on that and go more to the American model? Um, I I don't think so. I I think the geography and uh, uh, the demographics of Canada are such that you'll never quite see the same kind of hub and spoke system you see in the United States. But I do think, uh, Pamela, you're right. You're going to see... Uh, the continued need to go to a big urban center to take a lot of trips. Um, you know, the, the economics of airplanes are such that, um, you know, an efficient airplane to travel internationally, you got to put two or 300 people on. And you can't find two or 300 people that want to go every day to London or Paris or, or New York City in, in smaller communities. That's just, uh, until we have efficient one seat airplanes, uh, you're going to, you're going to see that uh, connecting phenomenon continue to occur. And then I, I just have one final question, Don, the notion of travel for those of us who do it a lot and regularly, um, this is not the, uh, luxury experience that it used to be when you got onto an airplane and their seats had room and somebody offered you a drink and God forbid if you were in business or first class, 
they brought food down the aisle and you chose what your your uh, dinner might be. That's gone. Is it forever? I, I think, uh, yeah, I think that is gone when you talk about an extreme, <laughs> except, or, except in, you know, business class and first class international. Yeah. That, that kind of travel is gone. You know, this has become North America, at least, form of, uh, of inner city bus service. I mean, yep. it, that, that's really what it is. Now, that being said, I think the airlines need to return to a time when they're more customer centric than they, they've been in recent years. We tried to do that with Porter. Now, Porter's a short haul carrier, but you know our whole uh, uh, purpose was to fl- return flying to something more refined than it had been in recent years. And I, th- I think we've been successful in doing that and we've conti- we're gonna continue to do that. Don, great to have you with us this morning. Thanks so much. Thank you, Bella, great to see you. Good enough. As promised, uh, Joe Sparling, the president and CEO of Air North, that's Yukon's airline, joins us now. Joe founded Air North in 1977. The Vinta Gwich'in First Nation were one of the first Canadian uh, First Nations to achieve a land claim settlement with self-governing authority. And they identified this airline that provided a lifeline to their community of Old Crow as a strategic investment. Joe, take us back just before we carry on with our larger discussion here about your kind of success story. You started out with the Cessna, one Cessna, trying to get your hours up. Well, that's that's correct. But, you know, in 44 years, I would describe our our growth as slow and methodical. Um, We uh, learned right after we built our our. uh, first hangar in uh, 1980 and the bottom fell out from beneath the economy that uh, you don't want to take on a lot of debt. And if you do, you want to pay it off as quickly as you can. So, you know, we've been very careful in our growth over the years. And and uh, I think we learned from from our early years experience. The, what's uh, your sorry, what's your assessment as as I put to dawn of of where things sit today? Where are we? Is this a disaster for your airline? Does it require just a major rethink? Uh, Are you dependent on the government to come up with some kind of response quickly and clearly? Where are you situated? Well, it's been a a challenge for us, absolutely. Uh, And we are very thankful for the financial aid that's been provided to date. Um, The first thing we did when when the bottom fell out from beneath the economy is we uh, knocked it back from about 30 flights a week to uh, three flights a week. Wow. And the first thing we heard from was the Yukon government, uh, you know, look, we need, uh, we need uh, essential medical travel because the uh, lot of Yukoners fly south for uh, medical uh, procedures. Uh, exactly. Supplies. So we had to immediately backtrack on our initial cutback and add in additional flights uh, on the assurance that, um, one way or another, there'd be some financial relief to to uh, uh, help us with the uh, flights that were not operating uh, profitably. Uh, s- since that time, um, you know, during the last uh, six months, we've generally been able to get our operation uh, at a level to where all of the flights are are uh, paying their way. The challenge for us now is, uh, um, you know, we're not generating enough flying. And the flights that we are flying aren't generating enough margin to uh, meet our overhead expenses, even though we've been able to knock about a third off of our overhead costs. I think as being a small carrier, we're pretty nimble and we're pretty responsive. And uh, I think that we've we've done a lot of things to uh, mitigate our losses. Uh, uh, but, you know, having said that, we can't go on like this forever. And, oh, yeah. It's a, it's I when doing the reading for this, it, you get some staggering figures. The north of this country has 40 percent of the land mass and 0.3 percent of the population. So if you do the math, this is a difficult proposition, even when you just get up in the morning. And it's obviously not going to be an Air Canada route. Well, uh, that is correct. The regional uh, communities are not served by the mainline carriers. The challenge for us is that the mainline carriers do tend to look at the uh, gateway routes, which are the uh, supply routes from the south into the north. And that's the challenge uh, for us. Um, 
you know, it's, it's like skimming the cream off of the top. Right. Um, right. You know, look after the whole barrel of milk. <laughs> you can't just take, uh, and, uh, while in a, in a healthy economy, in a growing economy, the uh, notion of competition was not terribly troublesome, but in a low demand environment, it is a problem for us. And, uh, it's making the, uh, subsidies that are received inefficient. It's diminishing their effectiveness for both us and Air Canada, quite frankly, the empty, nobody should be paying for empty seats flying around. Um, and it's requiring additional subsidy for us to provide the essential services that we need to provide. And it runs the risk of driving up pricing into the regional communities as well. So I think it's more a, uh, uh, for us, it's more a policy issue than one of uh, needing uh, a whole lot more money. Our problems could best be solved by policy rather than dollars. Okay, so let's get into that because you wrote a very detailed presentation to the government in their pre-budget consultations in which you really spelled these issues out. There's there's options, do nothing, subsidies, um, open borders, get more testing, encourage people to fly. Or four, and this seems to be your choice, as you've just noted, more policy and regulation to allow small scale um, regional operators to to really securely pick up the load that Air Canada and WestJet leave behind. Correct. I think that there is a role for regional carriers in the uh, national air transportation network and not necessarily at uh, a big cost to the mainline carriers. Um, I mean, our activities are a rounding error in terms of air capacity. (laughs) So, um, you know, we should be feeding um, the mainline carriers in the Southern hubs. Uh, But with respect to Northern carriers, we kind of need the Northern markets to ourselves. And since the mainline carriers are only interested in doing part of the job, um, you know, I think that uh, at this time in a period of low demand, limiting their capacity on the, uh, gateway routes, which are so important to us, uh, would lessen the subsidy required to keep the essential services going. Because we really have seen that happen. I mean, um, Porter was an example where uh, it flew out of the island airport in Toronto. Uh, Air Canada then asked for and received a presence on the island as well. When they start to impact the roots and the profitability of the other company, then they go and shut it down. I mean, that may be too simplistic approach to do it, but they had the means, certainly pre-pandemic, to play those kinds of games. Yes, and I think that, you know, they've been hurt by that before. I mean, typically when a new entrant starts up, uh, the only place that they're going to get business is on the prime routes that the mainline carriers fly. And, you know, you hear all the time, we're starting with two airplanes tomorrow and we're going to have 20 airplanes next year and 40 the year after. I think Northern carriers are a little bit different. I mean, we, we've we limited our growth and expansion opportunities by putting all of our infrastructure in the North. We're not going anywhere else. Right. But this is our only pie, but we need to have uh, the biggest piece of it, quite frankly, um, in order to survive and in order to provide efficient services um, within our region and to and from our region. So you basically in this new, you want, uh, you you kind of want a a tougher re-regulation of the world. And you're saying, put those rules around Air Canada too. Like this is our business. This is our bread and butter. We're prepared to survive, but you can't let them come in and skim off the top. Well, I don't think it's correct to say that we're asking for re-regulation. I I, I think we're be with a deregulated environment. We've asked for basically two things. I think uh, interline agreement should be mandatory between all Canadian air carriers. Okay. Um, it's a, and that's a very simple form of cooperation that quite frankly is kind of nation building because it links every community in Canada to every other community. Right now, if you're in Toronto and uh, you uh, have a desire to travel to Dawson City and you go to most of the uh, booking uh Uh, channels, uh, you will get the impression that it's impossible to fly from Toronto to Dawson City. Um, If you know enough about the market to know that uh, you can do so by buying two separate tickets on two carriers, then you can figure it out. Um, If you choose to leave Toronto on Air Canada, you actually can check your bags all the way through to Dawson City with us. With WestJet, you can't. Um, I think, you know, all carriers should be able to protect or, or connect bags all the way through. 
the the other impediment is that if you're going south and our flight happens to be late, uh, either Air Canada or WestJet can tell you you got to buy a new ticket. Going north, technically, we could do that too, but we never would. Um, but, you know, carriers should protect passengers through, uh, from delayed flights uh, from one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, what an interline agreement would do. The other, uh, the other thing is that uh, it, with a functioning interline agreement, uh, we would actually be able to sell to our customers uh, travel from White to Toronto, connecting with their Canada or WestJet in Vancouver. And connecting traffic accounts for about 40% of our market. So mm-hmm. the carriers have an edge or are able to compete in 100% of the market, we effectively can compete only in 60% of the market. So the, the playing field really isn't level. Again, an interline agreement would uh, would go a long way towards leveling the playing field. So mandate that you're saying that there, there has to be cooperation. I think there has to be. And you are seeing more and more stuff about the airline cooperation in a diminished demand environment. I just read a paper by mm-hmm. Luft Consulting yesterday that, uh, tells exactly that same story. And cooperation can start with an interline agreement. Uh, the other end of the spectrum would be mergers and acquisitions. And, um, you know, the if the uh, big carriers get bigger and the small carriers get smaller or disappear, that's not a good thing for the country. And it's uh, uh, it's not a good thing for competition. So well, so what is your what's your reaction to the transat purchase by Air Canada? Uh, it made sense. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were on the verge of getting an interline agreement with Air Transit. We were not on the verge of getting one with Air Canada. So, so in a sense, um, you know, uh, it, it, we took a bit of a hit or we'll take a bit mm-hmm. of a hit because of that. Uh, if we were able, able to interline with both, then it, it wouldn't really make any difference. But, you know, some consolidation is, is necessary. But go back to the, uh, to the uh, um, 1970s, you know, when there were... Uh, five regional carriers uh, all across Canada um, yeah. had, uh, had EPA, uh, uh, Winnipeg had Transair, uh, Quebec Air and Nordair in uh, Montreal and Pacific Western at that time was based in Vancouver. What deregulation did was uh, eventually Air Canada gobbled up all of those along with CPR and Wardair. Um, now, of course, subsequent to that, that created opportunities for other carriers, uh, WestJet being a prime example and ourselves. Uh, our growth wouldn't have happened, uh, you know, yeah. with that. But I think if you look back on it, the regions, uh, you know, Canada may have gained from deregulation in the busy markets and the busy routes, but I think the regions have suffered. Um, Halifax doesn't have uh, a major airline headquartered in in Halifax today, yeah. operating the most modern equipment. And if you go back on Wikipedia and, and remember where some of those carriers flew, they were flying all over the world. Nordair and uh, Quebec Air were flying to international destinations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, no, and I mean, today what we've got is, uh, you know, the premier of, of Saskatchewan writing letters to Ottawa saying, please don't shut down air traffic control in Regina. It's a provincial capital, but people won't land. People won't fly there if you don't have NAV Canada in operation. Uh, we're involved in that discussion a little bit as well, because okay. they're... You know, Enlighten me, please. Closing, <laughs> closing the tower in Whitehorse. And yeah. as an air operator um, and as an industry association rep, um, you know, Nav Canada has been killed, of course, by the lack of traffic. Um, they've put on the table a huge price increase. And we've said you got to find ways to cut costs rather than raising prices. So uh, as an operator based in Whitehorse, when they're talking about closing the control tower, I'm in a little bit of a difficult situation in that this is a cost cutting measure what we have suggested they do because once you close the tower it's not going to come back and i think whitehorse has a a rather unique mix of traffic um you know we even have uh, condor flying in the summer pre-pandemic so and it's the alaska highway route so there's a lot of uh, traffic transiting from alaska to the lower 48 so there's a lot of uh, there are some safety implications and the other major factor is we're a We don't have low-level radar yet in Whitehorse. So with low-level radar, it would be less of an issue than it is without it. So we've asked that NAV Canada look at ways to reduce staffing, to reduce hours, to uh, reduce costs, rather than closing the tower completely. And 
you know, Regina may be in a similar situation where they could find ways of cutting costs as opposed to closing the tower entirely. The um, some of the numbers that we were talking about, and I read this with interest in your uh, presentation to Ottawa, 23 independent carriers uh, in Canada. I don't think we even think about that. We just tend to think of, you know, Air Canada, WestJet. They go to 189 locations where only 57 of those communities are served by the the big guys, Air Canada or or WestJet. So this is actually really crucial. And and, and when you're talking about the North, not not just health care, it's it's food and supplies in for the winter months. All around Canada, there are, uh, as the numbers show, a number of small communities and a number of Canadian air carriers outside of the uh, mainline carriers, Air Canada and WestJet, that are providing an invaluable service to their regions. And I think that this is a great time to think about how we protect the service to the regions by facilitating the ability of small carriers to exist in the broader national transportation network and working more closely with the mainline carriers would be a huge step. And I think if the mainline carriers could come to the realization that, uh, you know, these guys can be allies uh, for us, they can feed us. And, and in fact, both Air Canada and WestJet have started their own feeder carriers, so to speak, where in Air Canada's case, they're actually buying capacity from an independent uh, carrier, Jazz. Um, they could be doing the same thing with uh, uh, independent regional carriers all around the country. They could be doing a better job of working more closely with regional carriers. And I think it would help to preserve service to regional communities. I think something to think about is that Uh carriers have more than a business affiliation with the communities they serve. Exactly. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a simple business decision. We're not going to fly to this place anymore. If you live here, you can't do that. Yeah. Uh, Getting phone calls at home. Uh, You know, we. (laughs) they know where you live. (laughs) They know where we live and they know how to get a hold of us. Yeah. Well, and when you talk about air Canada buying um, services from jazz, I mean, but that was their own creation. Yes. They're more inclined to obviously support their own offspring um, than to support you. And again, that comes back around to the question, which is some of this cooperation, it sounds kind of oxymoronic, but some of this cooperation has to be mandated. Uh, some of it does. And the interline agreements, I think, would look after that. And, and there's a great role for, for Jazz and Encore uh, in the national transportation network. But there are some communities that are already being served by regional carriers who are not Encore or Jazz. Uh-huh. And let's find a way to better integrate them into the overall network. As a country, we need a, a, a seamless network so that, uh, um, you know, going back to the Dawson City example, if Dawson wants to market tourism, they got to be able to let people know that you can fly to Dawson uh, yeah. doing them a disservice by, by not being able to market them in the, in the Southern centers and in other countries. So how would that work? I mean, what, what's the problem with, with not just whether you can connect and the luggage can connect, but what's the problem with joint marketing is something preventing that? Uh, well, it's the, the lack of an interline agreement. Most of the district okay. channels, it's the same issue. Yeah, it's the same issue, um, and uh, you know we would uh, we would be the ones that would that would be uh, with a, a, a meaningful interline agreement. We would be the ones that would be uh, reaching out to people, uh, marketing you know Toronto to Dawson City for only whatever the price may be. Uh, yeah. That thing doesn't exist now, and uh, and it needs to exist. Um, the. Ability and and we've got questions about this here too. The you know we always talk about the smaller airlines such as your own being, and and Dawn was talking about Porter that you're nimble. You know you can kind of change on a dime. You can decide you're going to change the flight or you can make it twice a week instead of four times a week. All of that um, is that uh, enough to survive in the short term? while this is being sorted out with Ottawa and with larger carriers? Well, if we were, were it not for the 
emergency wage service, uh, emergency wage subsidy, yeah. the Northern Essential Air Services subsidy, we would be running out of money fairly quickly. Like with, now. <laughs> well, not right now, but, yeah. uh, you know, months from now. Yeah. Um, and uh, with the subsidy money, you know, we have, it has been able to turn enormous losses into huge losses. Um, so we're, we're getting by um, and uh, uh, you know, but uh, I think that's why we've been so proactive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the paper that you read was not the first. Uh, you know, <laughs> and that's, it was four the, or five pages long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's probably number 12. I mean, we've, we've been wow. bombing, uh the government with suggestions as to as to our thoughts as to how to handle this for since it started the pandemic, quite frankly. Let's um, we have a question here from Ron Hill, and it, it raises this whole issue of in the context of the fear of flying and is flying ever going to come back? I mean, in your part of the world, my part of the world, there's no choice. So this is uh, whatever fears you have, you get past them. But uh, Ron points out that the federal government bought tens of millions of 15 minute antigen tests from Abbott Labs, right? Has anybody in the government approached you about the possibility of using these tests to screen people um, in order to deal with some of those fears and concerns? Well, we have certainly advocated for um, more use of testing. Um, uh, what we've done ourselves is we're not selling the middle seat. So you're never going to have to sit right, right. next to somebody uh, that you don't know. Um, we've curtailed our, or we've made changes to our, our uh, meal service. You, you were talking earlier about the, you know, nobody serves meals anymore. Well, it happens that we do. Um, you do get a meal when you fly with us. We have a flight kitchen uh, right on our property. And uh, one of the things that we've done in the pandemic is our flight kitchen has been proactive in selling their meals since they can't sell them, since they're not selling them to very many airline passengers, we're selling our flight kitchen meals in grocery stores and we're doing home delivery for people that uh, are shut in at home and want to buy uh, flight kitchen meals from us. So I, I think that's one of the things that we're doing to uh, get by and generate yeah. a little bit of incremental revenue and keep people working. That's uh, that's really interesting. I, I see Dawn's uh, face has shown up again there. Unmute yourself, Dawn, because I want to ask you about that. These these no these ideas of really making things work. Airlines are going to have to get into the business of takeout delivery. Uh, so <laughs> finding those kind of created what you know pizza delivery. Who knows? Um, and then come back to you as well on the question of testing and really stepping that up. And I, I really enjoyed Joe's comments. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't agree more with him on the whole subject of compulsory interlining uh, to, to make sure that the regions get get the kind of service they have. And I and I love the notion of uh, the entrepreneurial solution to finding ways to make bring a little more money in the door for for the very large airlines. That's that's very tough to make it meaningful. It just it, it's it's uh, it's great. I, I love the fact that Joe's figured that out for for his folks at, at, at least. But it, it's pretty tough when you have tens of thousands of employees to, to get them all back to work in some meaningful way. Um, as far as the testing is concerned, um, uh, you know, I think the airlines are receptive to anything that is likely to increase the probability that people will decide to take a trip. So if that's testing, great. Um, you know, what, what we don't want is probably is a regime whereby it is so onerous yeah. that it makes it less likely that people are yes. going to take a trip. The test has to be 72 hours exactly, yeah, exactly. and the, all exactly. of this. Um, the, the other so issue... Of, yeah. Let me just ask you both this, because in the early days of um, of the pandemic, and of course, uh, as a senator, you fly back and forth on a weekly basis. I got onto an airplane and the flight attendant said she was doing the Saskatoon Toronto route. And then she was going to, I can't remember, it was London or it was Paris, it was something. And I said, what, are they making you do this? And she said, no. She said the airlines have, uh, the planes have never been safer. They really have cleaned up the air system. 
and they really are cleaning the flights between cleaning the planes between flights, which they certainly weren't doing uh, pre-pandemic. So, Dawn, first to you, does that stuff have to stay in place? Yeah, and I and I think it will, uh, Pam. Uh, the the uh, uh, the airlines, I think, are much more sensitive than they've ever been to this whole issue. Even if it wasn't COVID, you know, can we help prevent the flu? How can we help prevent any disease spread? That being said, I I think it's remarkable how few cases have been traced. Yeah, in the airplane uh, right. almost almost none. Air circulation in airplanes is actually better than it is in most buildings. Um, it, it, this, this is not where our problem lies. I think it's been a great education for the airlines around cleanliness and making sure the air is clean. But uh, airlines are, are not our problem. If people aren't traveling because they're afraid uh, that, that a, an airplane is a Petri dish, all the data suggests that that is not the case. People Joe, wear masks on airplanes. Yeah, exactly. Joe, do you want to jump in on that? The the whole issue of cleaning and people's psychology about being in that very confined space. I mean, we're being told to stay six feet apart everywhere else in the world. And then, you know, let's hug and sit down. <laughs> well, Don's absolutely right. The HEPA filters have been on airplanes uh, since manufacture. So, you know, the 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 safety in terms of removing contaminants from the air has always been there. So, you know, as air operators, we need to, and we have been doing a pretty good job of reassuring passengers that, uh, you know, the air is safe, your risk of contamination is minimal. We have felt just because we live in a small town, all right, we'll keep the middle seat empty so that uh, you don't have to worry about sitting beside somebody, even though the risk is small. Right. I think what, what we're seeing in the North is not so much uh, that the, uh, Territory doesn't want people to travel, but they don't want out of territory travelers in the territory. And, and the territory, the territorial government is being very careful about that. You can't really argue uh, with it because, uh, you know, we, we, we uh, um, haven't had a lot of cases up here. Um, right. We had a travel bubble with British Columbia for a few months and it worked fairly well. But when the numbers in BC began to accelerate, uh, we got a few more cases in the Yukon, and so we have closed our BC travel bubble. And you know, so we're now we're now isolated again, and 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 people are paying attention. Nobody's traveling. As an air operator living in a small town, I can't. We can't tell people. Uh, you know, you should be flying. You should be traveling. Right. Uh, we're telling people when you're ready to travel, we're going to make it safe for you. Saskatchewan just uh, announced, I think, this week that they now want two tests. Uh, as you're coming in, I guess probably one before you take off and, and one when you land. And I guess to um, to Dawn's point, if we make it so complicated, it's going to be a disincentive uh, on its face. Agreed. Yeah. All right. A question here about uh, border airports, because we, we see a lot of this, people trying to get to their places in Florida or, you know, I don't know, maybe not so much. Texas these days, John. You've got too much snow down there. And I'm glad to see you at least have some lights on where you are. We were worried about you there. But seriously, like when you're thinking about places like Buffalo or Great Falls or Oxenburg, this is where people go. You know, they drive across and then get on a plane. If we kind of acknowledge that and brought it into the discussion, would that help us uh, both on the cost front and the fear front? <clears throat> Joe, do you want to go ahead? Well, uh, you know, we don't fly that close, right? Service internationally. We do have a summer charter program between Fairbanks and Dawson city, which has been uh, wiped out uh, yeah. this year um, and last year uh, because of that. I, I think it's a, it's a real problem with the, the uh, you know everything you read in the paper about the uh, the uh, uh, at least in the you know the last year the uh, uh, problems with with COVID in the states. So yeah, you know, I, I I think that uh, I don't know if Canada's uh, a lot of people agree. I think with the with the border closures. I don't with know the shutdown. Yeah. Yeah. Don, what's your view on that? Trying to do a deal with the kind of acknowledging reality that people are going to do this. 
Yeah, I, it kind of is a tough question. As Joe points out, I think it's it's demonstrated to be reasonably politically po- uh, uh, popular to have the border closed. Yeah. Uh, if you live in Dallas and you have grandchildren in Toronto, it's not so popular with you. But right. Um, uh, you know, at, at some point, there's going to have to be, uh, you know, a, a means of thinking this through in more in more detail. I'm, I mean, I've, I'm vaccinated, but and I'm a Canadian, but yeah. I can't come to Canada without, um, you know, some. You've got to go stay in a hotel for three days and you right. don't know what that hotel looks like and all the rest. So, you know, that, that, that's unfortunate. But, you know, as long as it's the will of the Canadian people at the border stay closed. You know, I'm a great believer in democracy. That's, yeah. that's what will happen. I, I, I think it's uh, to some degree unnecessary. I, I think there's a desire not to be exposed to the U.S., which has yeah. been a much more open economy. Um, yeah. Like you, I travel. I'm back and forth to, to California all the time. Um, but uh, and it, it just seems... Uh, frustrating to me that I can't visit friends and family in Canada, but yeah. you know, we're going to live with that, I think. Well, if we ever get our vaccination act together here uh, north of the 49th, yeah. that would help. Okay, we're going to wrap up with one question to each of you. Uh, Don, I'll start with you. Give the last word to Joe. If you were the transport minister in Canada and you could wave your little magic uh, wand, Don, what's the one thing you would do tomorrow morning? Well, I, I I would I would in, uh, si- simply decide uh, on what you want that uh, support program to look like. The minister has now heard from everybody. Right. Everybody will not be happy with every aspect of whatever policy he decides. But I, I think enough time has passed. In fact, maybe too much time has passed. It's time the government decides what, if anything, they're going to do. Um, because by not doing anything, you're making a decision. Every yes, day, exactly. things are changing. WestJet canceled service to four more cities, I gather, in the last day or so. Yeah. So I, 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 I would make that policy decision. It's timing. Joe, uh, despite your 12 letters to the federal government, if you were on the receiving end, uh, what one paragraph or line would you take out of there and say, that's, that's smart, let's do that tomorrow morning? Well, I would agree with Don to move ahead with a with a support yeah. program. I mean, our industry needs help, but look after the regional carriers in doing so along the lines of uh, our two suggestions. Yeah, I think that seems to be the obvious uh, answer here, which is just make a damn decision. <laughs> Maybe that will get us from point A to point B. All right. Thanks very much. This has just been so interesting. Don Cardi. Um, uh, former CEO of American Airlines, uh, Hawaii Airlines, Virgin Airlines, Porter Airlines. They hit, the list is long. Your time and thoughts today have been really appreciated. And Joe Sparling, president and CEO of Air North, Yukon's airline, with a really interesting perspective uh, coming from the north and a regional carrier. This is something that has got to be reflected in this country because it's how we move. So thank you much. Uh, thank you both very much. And I'll turn things back to Greg and for a final word. You. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank all three of you. Just again, just a quick word of thanks. It's you've accomplished everything we're trying to get out of these sessions. And I see some comments in the chat suggesting as much. So again, uh, I wish you, uh, uh, Mr. Cardi, quick recovery and uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Sparling, with your operations there. I hope all this comes to a quick conclusion. Thanks again. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much.